Hello, hello, hi, welcome everyone. I want to welcome you all to the Connor Boys podcast this week. Um, my name is Everett Stevenson, and I'm joined with a couple of my co hosts. Hey, everybody, my name is Malik Foster, another co host for the Connor Boys podcast. Hey, everybody, I'm your third co host, Samantha Adams. And this week, um, we have a topic that I think has been kind of long awaited for a lot of people. Um, and what we are talking about is Biden's plan to um, decriminalize marijuana. So before we get into that, I want to um, first and foremost kind of explain what it means, right? It's one thing to legalize mar- marijuana. It's something else to decriminalize it. Legalizing it simply is, hey, you can have smoke weed, carry weed, whatever, whatever, right? Decriminalizing it, on the other hand, makes it legal and it also wipes away um, the the criminality of it. So let's say somebody got a weed charge, whether it be back in the day or they're currently incarcerated right now for weed. Um, To decriminalize it would mean, you know, if they had a weed charge from the past, it comes off of their record. If they're in jail, they get out of jail for it. He's pardoning anybody that's in prison, federal prison, for um, for weed. Um, I know we had a similar discussion about um, <clears throat> Donald Trump offering clemency to people in the past, in past podcasts, but what the, I just want to kind of explain it a little bit. So you have state laws and you have federal laws, and the federal government only has jurisdiction over federal laws. They don't have jurisdiction over state laws unless the two um, conflict with one another. And if they conflict, then the federal law um, will win, right? So, but when you're talking about things like this, if a, if the feds decriminalize um, marijuana, then it could have an effect on the states. Now, granted, many states, probably like almost half the states in the country have already um, legalized marijuana, and a number of them have also decriminalized it. So, you know, to do it on a federal level, a lot of people have been waiting for it. The thing of it is, is it's not a law, right? <clears throat> not yet, not on the federal level. Um, Congress has not passed the law. That's what makes the law. The president signs it, and that's how it becomes a law. So what he's doing is he's take, make, using his executive power as president to try to decriminalize it as best he can until Congress does something. So that's pretty much the background of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I don't know if the guys have anything that they want to add, but that's the gist of what we are talking about today. Did you guys have anything you wanted to add? Uh, No, I I do want to say that one of the things that I did notice um, with that announcement that President Biden had made was that it was going to... um, also free a lot of individuals who have um, a simple marijuana um, marijuana charge, meaning that there were no additional charges outside of that that they just were found with uh, marijuana. And for that, they have to do um, federal time. So I, I definitely think that this is going to open the door for, again, the, I don't know the exact sum, but we know it's in the thousands of individuals who may have had their lives um, placed on hold for simple marijuana possession. Um, so that's that. Um, I don't think it necessarily just to kind of di- distinguish. I don't necessarily think it distinct. Um, will be the same for people who may have had marijuana possession or be in possession of marijuana in large amounts, which would be people who may be considered to be having marijuana with the intent to distribute. Um, if you're maybe pumped with pounds or a thousand, you know, multiple pounds of marijuana, that that may be viewed as a little different story. But you know, an individual who maybe has, um, I don't know, the exact amount, but let's say, you know, a quarter pound or you know, uh, an eighth of a pound or something like that, um, that may be a little bit different and those individuals likely will be able to come home so under this next presidential um presidential order yeah yeah so mainly uh back on uh, piggyback on what you're saying is uh yeah just like mere possession like so if there's any other 
charges you have, like maybe trafficking or something else like that, then you're not eligible. But if you recall with just merely possessing it and not trying to distribute it, like you said, or a certain amount of weight, then, you know, you're fine. But if you're caught with doing those other things, like having trafficking it, um, you know, other, uh, let's say a certain amount of weight, like you were saying, tend to distribute stuff like that, then that's totally different from just mere merely possession. Um, so that that's one thing. Um, another background on this uh, pardon is uh, that also if you're um, uh, a legal immigrant or non citizen, this doesn't apply to you. It just applies to the citizens. So that's another little tidbit out there for people to know about it. And also the White House was saying that the reason why they did this is because it was part of a campaign promise, as well as, uh, you know, this gives an opportunity for some of those people who had those mere possession charges um, to be able to be able to rent homes easier um, and also uh, attain jobs and educational opportunities. Uh, so so that would help with their records. So um, that's a little bit of background. Do you want to get to the next little sub part of this about who it impacts? Yeah. So, you know, tip, honestly, it impacts black men more than it impacts anybody else. Um, because black men are typically arrested at a higher rate than anybody else. And when I say anybody else, I mean anybody else in this country. Um, and so, you know, we started seeing that happening more, I think, probably like in the 70s and 80s when the crime bill got pa passed and you started seeing people go to jail for these things. Um, when you're talking about federal crimes, right, I just want to also make, make you guys aware um, that federal crimes typically happen when somebody crosses state lines. So if somebody's possession, possessing marijuana and I don't know, New York, and then they go to New Jersey, that's a felony. I mean, not a felony, that's a federal offense. And so um, those are the people that are impacted, people who may have crossed state lines or participated in things that involved multiple states. Um, and so that typically is how that works. Now, are there other ways to, um, quote unquote, qualify for being a federal offender? Yes, but that's typically how it works in order for the feds to get involved in something like anything related to drugs whether it be possession, trafficking, conspiracy, things like that. So, um, you know, the fact that it impacts Black men the most um, makes for an interesting conversation, right? And the reason why it makes for an interesting conversation is because, you know, when you look at the Fed, the Fed has not legalized marijuana. But like I said before, many states have. And with that being said, like, um, you got to wonder why the heck we haven't, why, why Congress hasn't passed any federal legislation yet. And so, um, I mean, I get and appreciate the fact that Joe Biden has made the decision to exercise his executive power and just do this mass pardoning of people, predominantly black men, right? Because here's the other thing. If people are, um, when people get arrested specifically for felonies, they become disenfranchised, meaning they are no longer able to vote, right? Unless they are able to get their rights reinstated. And so to decriminalize something like this, um, it's just questionable about whether or not felonies, are fel having felony weight is affected or if it's only at a misdemeanor level um, since the weight is, you know, gonna matter. Right. Um, and so I think um, I think it's important to recognize like the, a bunch of people are going to get released. One of the things that Joe Biden said was he found it utterly ridiculous for so many people to be in jail or incarcerated for these marijuana charges. And they're getting heavier sentences than people who have possessed things like marijuana or even fentanyl. So, um, you know, 
I think I just find it to be very interesting. The timing of it is also interesting. I mean, sometimes you just got to get in where you fit in. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it's very, very interesting about the timing and who specifically it affects. I mean, I get the fact that it was a campaign promise, but, you know, you can't help but wonder. It it's, uh, affects Black men the most, which in turn um, affects Black families the most. So well, well, see, that goes into the impact, like uh, impacting um, elections. Like, I, I really think it's a midterm move. It could be a feather in the Democratic Party's cap and uh, President Joe Biden's cap as well. Um, like, hey, I, I completed a campaign promise, even though when the White House said it, it's not really that effective. Right. It's it's. This only applies to federal prisons and simple possession, and that's it. It doesn't cover non-citizens, as I mentioned earlier, and it doesn't cover anything else. If somebody was charged with something else and the simple possession doesn't cover that. Uh, Also, it's not uh, dealing with states, right? Uh, So in order to get that done, we have to get petition Congress to change some of the laws on that. Um, and some of the states will have to change some of their laws if we want to just get, change the law federally and also the states. So they, they are urging the states to follow suit with some of their pardons, uh, the governors of the states to do some state pardons as well. But, so we'll see how that goes. But this is definitely, to me, a political move to kind of get some more of these Black men in particular to vote because that's who it most likely, that's who it affects the most, right? Um, President Biden in 1994, he had his crime bill legislation. Um, he's known, that's one of the bad things he's known for. And, you know, he started some of this stuff, like Sam mentioned, like uh, there's other drugs that people aren't being targeted for, but, uh, you know, when it's mere marijuana possession, people are being targeted for it because that's something that black people more so are caught with as opposed to those other drugs black people don't really and like mess with at all. Even though it's been proven, you know, white people smoke marijuana just as the same rate as black people, but that's the drug that they decide to use to attach to black people is marijuana. But uh, back in to the 90s, uh, with the crime bill legislation, they were saying that, you know, marijuana is a gateway drug, gateway drug. But now you're seeing uh, a lot of businesses come up with uh, ma- uh, these marijuana shops, um, uh, the, the weed dispensaries, excuse me, weed dispensaries uh, come up and all this stuff. People are making money over it. And like you said earlier, Sam, um, a lot of uh, states have legalized it or decriminalized it. Um, so things have changed, but you still have to remedy that harm in the past. Like, yeah, you, you guys are promoting gateway drugs, dangerous drugs, all this stuff. And now, you know, people are making money off of it and uh, decriminalizing it. So it's time for uh, Congress to step in and make a new law and as well as some of these states to at least decriminalize it. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, the president is doing all he can do with the, with his scope of power currently. But like you said, I think in order for us to enact the supremacy clause, which allows that any of the federal rules that apply can trump any state rules, we need Congress and we need Congress in action in this. Um, and I think, you know, um, while, like you said, Malik, this could be a, a real big move for the Democratic Party, who, which is typically has been associated with the uh, um, the um, culture, the black culture as a race or minority cultures. Um, this also allows for um, a lot more. And I think this is where it gets a little shaky is when you look at the, those states that maybe, you know, more Republican ran. Um, are those are those officials going to be willing to get on board? And I don't necessarily know if you can get them there. I think uh, one of the things that may um, help push that agenda would be for them to, for the government to tie some type of incentive in on that, whether it be, you know, more money for schooling or more money for infrastructures and roads, things of that nature. 
I think that would help get more governors on board because they will be able to bring in a, a, a bigger bottom line for their state and then allow for other um, other resources to come in, in into their state um, as well. So I think that's something that, you know, the government and Congress could try to work on. Well, Congress do it on their own, then it's, it's a done deal. But in the event that they don't, um, if the president um, could work on reallocating some of the funds that he may be able to control um, to the states and allow them to understand that they come with a stipulation of, you know, um, releasing simple offense marijuana charges, then I think we will really be able to see a lot more individuals um, be free and, and have more of an interest in the things that's going on in the government as well and um, likely become more voters. Yeah, I was going to say, um, uh, to your point, E, um, yeah, I think I think uh, in order for Congress to really act, you know, that would have a really interesting impact, right? When if Congress decides to act, right? Because uh, if they if they abolish, like if they decriminalize it, right, and make it like where you know it's not illegal anymore, federally, uh, that that would get rid of you know the state's obligation of doing things as well. well as they're going to have to remedy some of this stuff where people's people are getting jail jail time a lot of years for just having mere possession. Like especially here in Georgia, there's some instances where people got a lot of time for for marijuana possession. Uh, just for an example, like years. Uh, like they'll propose maybe t- like 10, 15, 20 years even just for marijuana. So there's some instances where you could do a lot of time for just mere possession of marijuana, um, which ostracizes those individuals just for simple possession of drugs. Because now the movement is when you're dealing with some of these drugs, it's like, oh, it's a mental health issue. But, you know, back in the 90s, it wasn't treated as such. And it was like, let's slot these people up, mainly black people, most of the black, mostly black people. So um, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, um, I wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, uh, I, I looked at uh, an article that was done on CNN.com and um, pretty much it says that the president will take an executive action, like we said, to pardon, um, federal, um, pardon all prior federal offenses of simple marijuana possession and that he has directed the Department of Justice to review how the, and this is important, how the drug has been categorized under federal law. It's currently scheduled on the same level as more harmful substances like LSD, heroin, and fentanyl, and methamphetamines. The White House officials said that there are 6,500 people convicted of simple possession of weed under the federal law between 1992 and 2021, thousands more faced state convictions. And he went, like I said, he said, nobody should be in jail just for using or possessing marijuana. Um, the reason why that's important is, you know, a lot of these people got convicted even before his crime bill, which is important. Um, his crime bill did not do anything to help the situation, but that's essentially how it started. And so, I think it's important to point that out um, because, yeah, he, he was a he was a very active uh, participant with that crime bill. And it had a huge negative impact on the on the black community in this country. And so, you know, that's 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 great. Sixty five hundred people are probably going to be going home and getting things taken off of their criminal record. Um, but as it relates to the states, right, when you have states that have already de- decriminalized, like here in Georgia, there have been a couple of counties that have decriminalized it, or what they're doing is they're, they, if it's a misdemeanor, lightweight, like if it's um, under a certain weight, it's a misdemeanor, and they will not prosecute. They don't prosecute for a number of reasons, right? One reason is because, um, one of the biggest reasons is because hemp is federally legal, and because hemp is legal on the federal level, you can't get prosecuted for a possession of hemp. And in order to be able to, to um, actually determine, because remember, 
when you are charged with a crime, they have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Although, you know, they don't always work like that. That's, that's the standard. And in order to prove that, that we, every, any, any defense attorney worth their salt is going to require um, the prosecutor, the DA, the solicitor, the state attorney, whatever they're called in your state, to have that tested, or they're going to te- have it tested themselves to determine whether or not it is in fact hemp or if it is in fact marijuana. Because if it's hemp, then there's no case. You see what I'm saying? They have to dismiss it. And the issue is that when you do that, there's not enough, excuse me, when it's under an ounce, there's not really enough substance to be able to test it appropriately. And so, because they have to run multiple tests. So that's another reason why a lot of times you see in states where marijuana is illegal, where they will not prosecute um, for uh, anything under an ounce. So there's that. But then you also have states that have legalized marijuana, but they have not decriminalized it. So where you somebody may have a weed charge on their criminal record, but now they can roll up and smoke outside. You see what I'm saying? So you know, you have, you have these different, it's like a dichotomy, like you have these different aspects. And so one thing that we often say here, whenever you see these laws that are like kind of all over the place is that the federal government needs to step in and make a law so that it's uniform everywhere because it decreases confusion. Because what happens if somebody comes from a state where weed is legal and they go to a state where it's illegal? Is it your responsibility to know the law before you enter a state? Yes. Do people go and look up the law? No. And so that puts people in like a really tough spot because the last thing you want to do is come from Colorado and come to Georgia and you got weed and you thought that it was cool and now you're going to jail, right? That's not, that ain't it, right? So, you know, you really want to make sure, you should definitely be trying to make sure that you um, know the law before you go anywhere, but the federal government um, enacting a law, an established law, rather than the president, you know, exercising his executive power to go ahead and and try to fulfill that campaign promise, it will absolutely help a lot. Because if another president comes in and they're not in agreement with what Joe Biden is doing, they're just going to change it. And that's why it's important to go ahead and create a law as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think we just need a federal law on this. I think we need to get it across the board. And I think, um, you know, if Joe Biden is really serious, he he should do that. All right. Uh, The optics of this pardon looks good. You know, it's a campaign promise. But uh, until the United States uh, uh, makes a law on the books and, you know, Remy those who were, uh, convicted of the possession of marijuana, um, and it was criminalized wrongfully so because now we're we're seeing all these other drugs and all this other stuff looked at as you know mental health issues, um, other issues. Um, also, uh, marijuana also serves as a medicinal purpose, right? It's not just you know recreational use in all cases, so. Um, that's another aspect of this, but I think the main thing is political here. Um, that's my thoughts because we do have the midterms coming up and, you know, Biden has been polling really horribly, even amongst black people, like he's under the percentage he was in at in 2020 in his approval rate rating. And that's some of the biggest difference in the country between black people, his approval rating and uh, when he won the presidency till now. So that that's a big factor, I think, a big contributor to a reason why he did this move, because it also looks like a good optics and it doesn't really remedy the situation that, <laughs> that, that much, honestly. Um, but it looks good. You know, it's not a bad thing, but it just it, it's some other things that could really help better that I think he could probably do. Um, But this is a good start, I think, and it's a campaign promise. So um, glad he did it. You got any thoughts, Lee? Yeah, no, um, I pretty much agree with most of what you guys are saying. I definitely think that this is a step in the right direction. 
Um, and happy to see this. I definitely know that it will help. I would love for us to be able to see some of the states um, again contribute and, and follow suit with this, um, whether it's by force and meaning that Congress go ahead and make a law and then they have to follow it, or if it's by, you know, um, reward in regards to, you know, the federal government looking for ways to try to uh, fund um, the, the, the project and allow for, you know, states to receive some type of benefits from it. Um, because at the end of the day, one thing we do have to look at too with this is the loss that it, that come from this, you know, whether it's the states, which we know a lot of states, um, but they said it and mentioned it even in like Arizona, one particular state was one that said that, you know, if, if they lose a certain amount of their prison population, the state would no longer be functionable, like they weren't able to receive enough taxes. So we also have to consider the fact that um, one of the reasons why, you know, we have, um, I don't want to say a crime bill, but why we have over-policing in certain situations is because, unfortunately, a lot of people are able to make money off of um, prisoners. And so that's one factor that I think can also deter some of the states from looking to looking forward with um, trying to uh, release individuals for just simple marijuana. However, I do think overall that it would be a great a great thing, um, and I, I think it's a good step what the president is doing. And I also think it'd be a better one if for the states to follow suit with this. Um, but like I said, just looking at all things considered. You know, it's definitely an uphill battle with that being said. Yeah, I want to dig into a, a little bit of, of something you just said, E, and I, and I think it's a very profound point that you made um, as it relates to how I think you said it was Arizona, like the state essentially could go bankrupt if they free too many of their slaves, essentially, right? And the reason why I say that is because um, when when you talk about slavery, the 13th Amendment only a lot like slavery is illegal, except when you're talking about people who have been incarcerated. That is the only time that you can legally enslave people. And many states, counties, cities, municipalities and whatever literally run on the backs of people who are in prison or jail. Like when you look at um, the amount of money that people have to pay in fines, right, or bail or things like that, um, how much money they have to pay in restitution, things like that. People can't afford that, right? And so they, it, it's almost like a setup, right? You, you, you put people who typically have a hard time financially already, like living paycheck to paycheck, robbing Peter to pay Paul, and maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they didn't make a mistake and got accused of making a mistake and can't get their way out of it so that they just take a plea because that happens way more often <laughs> than a lot of people realize. And then what happens is, you know, because they're living in an over-policed place, a uh, uh, section of their city, town, whatever. And, um, and now they're forced to pay all this money to get out of the trouble that they're in. They pay this money. Now they have this scarlet letter on their back from some conviction. And if they can't afford to pay, they go back to jail. And it just adds and adds and adds and adds on top, on top, on top. It's called recidivism. And sometimes people end up getting back out there doing the things that they wasn't supposed to be doing, like selling weed, just so that they can try to keep from going back to jail or keep the lights on or keep food in their refrigerator. You know what I mean? Things like that. And so it just creates this cycle. Um, and it's not, it's not healthy because at the end of the day, although we're talking about dollars and cents and, and money and, you know, keeping, keeping, you know, these states above ground financially and all that, we're also talking about the lives of people and how these lives are affected throughout generations. So when you're taking fathers away from their families, what does that do to the family? What does that do to the wife or the mother? What does that do to their children? How does that negatively impact families? And when you look at the history of black families, you see when the separation of the husband and the wife or the mom and the dad happens, it has a negative impact and it creates more problems than it fixes. 
you know, you have at that point, um, women typically becoming more reliant on the state to help fill in the gap where that man was filling in financially. And so, you know, whether it be because they're on public assistance, now don't get it twisted, okay? More Black people are not the ones that receive the most in, in, in um, state benefits. Black people are not the biggest recipients of food stamps and things of that and welfare. Uh, white people are. Uh, surprise, surprise, because a lot of people will try to tell you something different. But when you look at the statistics, it's not like that. That in part is because there are more white people in, in this country than there are anything else. So um, there's that. But at the same time, these families are still torn apart. It has a psychological and emotional impact on those families, right? And so when you're talking about, to tie it into something that Malik also said that I wanted to dig in a little bit um, about, is when you're talking about these families and you're talking about income, right now, one of the other reasons why Joe Biden's um, popularity rate is not that great is because People are struggling. People are hurting financially, right? And so because they're hurting financially, you're not seeing a lot of changes. You're not, well, and if you are, they're not that great, right? Especially when you're talking about finance and it puts people in a bad spot. And so you made, he, they made all these promises when he accepted his um, presidency and you ain't seen much, right? We had the anti-lynching bill passed. That's, that's good, you know? You got this thing going on. That's good. But what about the, the criminal justice reform? What about the George Floyd bill? Like that is huge. And it would have such a huge impact. Start doing other things to create jobs. You can't keep expecting the same. Um, like we're different. Everything is different now. Right. And you can't keep applying the same rules to something that is grown. That's like putting a plant in a pot that's too small. We're not, we don't have the problems we had 20 years ago. These are new problems and we need a new pot. So it's time to start catering, you know, the, the rules, the laws and all that stuff and the way things work to what's going on right now, not to how things were going 20, 30 years ago, because it's not going to work. And that's the reason why we keep finding ourselves in these positions where things are like crazy. You know, and there's always so much going on. It doesn't matter. And at this point, it doesn't matter who the president is, right? We have to try to find different ways to go about doing things. There's more than one way to skin a cat, as my father used to always say. And so I think that we need to find another way because what we've been doing ain't working. And and um, all the infighting and all that is not progressive. We have to find ways to find make progress in, in what's going on. Um, so I just wanted to say that I'm going to get off my little soapbox and we can just go ahead and move on a little bit more, um, digging into, you know, states that haven't legalized marijuana, what type of impact that could potentially have. Like, you know, if, if this, because the president is pardoning, okay, I just want to be clear because people will get it misconstrued because the president is exercising his um, executive right and pardoning people and trying to decriminalize it on a federal level. If you live in a state where it is still considered criminal to possess marijuana, his, um, his executive action is not going to have any effect on the Ill illegality of possession of marijuana. Meaning, if the president pardons a bunch, 6,500 people on a federal level, and you live in a state like Georgia where it is illegal to possess marijuana, it will remain illegal to possess marijuana until the state decriminalizes it, until the state says it's not illegal. Well, well the, Sam, uh, um, to your point, like the you can also have the governors uh, um, actually, uh, pardon it right. because I think that I think in North Carolina they're, they're having some discussions on that, right? Governor Kemp's not doing that, though, right? <laughs> He's not doing that Never now. Know. If Stacey Abrams wins the next election, we got something to talk about, right? But Governor Kemp ain't doing that, 
he is a Republican Republican. His campaign, in his campaign commercials, he was oh, I don't know if that's part of her campaign promises, but I would have to check. He is definitely, she's definitely for that. decriminalizing marijuana. He's open to that? Okay. So, you know, because because she's about criminal justice reform and supporting Black men and, and getting back to Black families and building that kind of stuff up. The thing about Stacey Abrams, her platform is very different. It is a very progressive and she's a black woman. So she has very different views about things. Um, governor Kemp is very Republican. And what I was going to say is I remember when he was running for governor, his commercial, he was he had a gun to a little boy. So I'm like, I believe in my rights. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, OK, you ain't got to put the gun in the little boy face, though, to say that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I just think, you know, um, I think that it's important to recognize that, um, I'm sorry, to understand and know that if you are in a state where marijuana is not legal, um, the, the, the executive action of President Biden is not going to have an effect on that state's law unless that state changes the law, whether it be the, the, the governor utilizing his executive action or if it's the state's Congress that goes ahead and makes changes to that law. Um, it's that legislation. Um, otherwise, we got to wait for the feds. So we got to wait for the con federal Congress, you know, to go ahead and make that happen. And I don't know what the holdup is, but, you know, it's over time. It's past due. And there's a lot of promises that Joe Biden made um, during his campaign that are past due. And I mean, I appreciate the fact that he's trying to do something, but more needs to be done in my eyes. And, and that I think a lot of black people probably feel the same way. Hence why a lot of black folks ain't really all that happy with um, Joe Biden right now. And definitely not happy with Kamala cause she's quiet. We like, you barely ever hear anything from her. So I just wanted to go ahead and, and say that. Um, with that being said, solutions, I think we've kind of discussed the solutions all throughout, right? Legislation. We need federal legislation to protect, you know, the executive action of President uh, Joe Biden. And if you have that federal le legislation, then everybody will be protected. It won't be, um, you know, uneven going from state to state. You don't know which was going on here. If I'm going from, you know, Massachusetts, I can go to Massachusetts, I can go to Colorado, I can go to um, California, I could go to New York, but then I can't go to like, I don't know what it is in Virginia. I'm not going to lie to you. I would have to look it up. I don't know if it's legal or illegal in Virginia. If it's illegal in Virginia, then there you have it. But you then you try to come to Georgia and you know it's illegal. It's like you don't know what's going on from state to state. And so I think that it's important to recognize it and, and, and understand it. And know what's going on. Oh, one thing I, I think I, we forgot to mention, this does cover all of D.C. Got to mention that. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But, but yeah, yeah. Um, as far as solutions, besides the federal law, obviously, if the federal law, if the Congress doesn't want to do anything about it, at least the states can take it upon their own hands to do something about it. Like in North Carolina, they're thinking about like doing some pardons and um, changing Changing the laws there, decriminalizing stuff, uh, at least from the Democratic side. I think that would be a big win for them, right? Um, politically, uh, I think that would be a big win. It would help, uh, you know, strengthen the bond between, you know, their biggest supporters, which are Black uh, women and men, um, respectively. So I think that, that will go a long way but to say they're trying to do something, right? So, uh, but that's on the state side uh, that Sam didn't mention. But obviously the main one is Congress. That's the real big solution. But if, that, if that's not possible, which is more likely because if they did do that, they would definitely have to um, probably remedy the fact that some of these people are in jail. A lot of people are in jail for just simple possession of the marijuana and they would have to get rid of a lot of people in those jails. And we all know, you know, a lot of black, it's a lot of black people in jail for some of this stuff, uh, even though they shouldn't be, uh, even if, you know, the, their white counterparts had a situation like that. Uh, we, we know this when there's more white people doing certain drugs and no, not really many black people doing certain drugs, it's treated as a mental health issue. So, 
Um, that's another thing to think about. But that's as far as the solutions I can really think about. Like just saying hey, the laws need to change. That's it. Uh, you got anything, E? Yeah, for me, I, I think like you guys both hit it on the nail. I think we need to see congressional support with this, um, as well as if we don't, you know, if uh, governor say, you know, um, executive action and orders to do this as well. If not, then, you know, uh, some state senators as or excuse me, state Congress members, um, could, state legislators rather, um, would be able to help correct this remedy as well. Um, but those are all the actors that I think that have major roles in this and that could uh, bring about change. But that being said, though, I do want to go ahead and move into our Black Business of the Month, which is The Hungry Black Man. Um, again, you can find his website or excuse me, his Instagram and website page. He goes around the country um, promoting and tasting different restaurants. Um, generally, that are most likely either serving ethnic ethnic food or are black owned. Um, you guys can check out their website, and then also we want to give reference to the Black Book of the Month, which is Between the World and Me, um, which is a, a Tanashi Coates book. Uh, basically, it's it's like a memoir of a father writing storylines to his son and giving him details as to the experiences in life that he has dealt with um, coming up as a Black man. Um, definitely a good read, you know, especially for any young man that may be coming out here in this world and just want to kind of understand what they may be facing um, if they haven't had anyone that was able to kind of put, put things in perspective for them. Um, or if they're fortunate enough to live in, in the area in which they weren't necessarily having to face a lot of the uh, issues that many um, many young men, young Black men in particular, uh, face in a lot of the urban cities that they are live, that we lo- that, excuse me, that they may live in. Um, and lastly, for our quote of the month, give me just one second, guys, as I pull this one up. Um, the quote of the month this week is by Mujad Freed, and he says that this great struggle requires the participation of all freedom-loving people. It is through the u- unity we will be successful. And I think that that quote um, fits for this topic simply because it's, again, we need individuals who are um, lovers of freedom to understand that there's remedies that need to be made for individuals who have been wrongfully or not necessarily wrongfully who have been um, locked up for something that we can look at to see or consider to be a minor crime if and should not even be a crime in some senses. Um, so that's why I believe this quote was very fitting because again, it's through the unity of those individuals that we will become to see that, you know, success in the right, in the rights of this, these individuals not being necessarily um, over, I won't say over police, but uh, over incarcerated. And for us to be able to have stronger communities because we will have more individuals inside of those communities to help build them up. So those are the few things that I want to just give reverence to. Um, as we ended this uh, show, I want to go ahead. I don't know if you guys have some more thoughts or anything that y'all want to talk about real quick, but um, yeah. I, just, I wanna... just wanted to say excessive punishment is whack. That's it. Right. I agree. Yeah, that, that's all. That's all we have. I mean, I don't have anything else. Uh, you guys can catch us also live on Instagram at Counterpoints Podcast every Wednesday at 8.30-ish. We go live, interact with our viewers, and talk about a range of topics, uh, even do games um, and different scenarios. So, you guys, check us out. Once again, Counter Voice Podcast. Yep, our socials are going to pop up at the end. Um, you guys, we love y'all. Thank y'all for tapping in with us. Every single chance y'all get, we appreciate it more than you even know. With that being said, y'all go ahead and enjoy your week. Hopefully, we'll see you Sunday. Be good to one another. We out of here. All right. Peace. Oh, like, share, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend. That part.